So on this, we're going to look at the coefficient of determinant being the R squared. So what we can learn is that throughout the study period, Mopani district was the only one with the highest relationship between bovine and brucellosis, while the other districts had the lowest um, uh, relationship. Now moving to rainfall variability, we also found that uh, Mopani district again, and this time along with Capricorn district, they had um, a bit higher relationships with the bovine brucellosis cases. <coughs> so this is uh, from table here, this is where the Pearson's uh, correlation, oh. Oh, sorry. Okay. This is why the Pearson's correlation coefficient was employed. Now we found that um, the correlation was um, found to be, uh, there was a weak correlation in mobile. Okay, the tables are for each district. So this table is for Capricorn district. So the correlation we're looking for, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's bovine brucellosis against the climatic factors. So for this one, it's also, it was found to be um, non there was no correlation, a weak correlation that was non-significant. And then the very same thing was found in Mopani district whereby the, the correlations were weak and non-significant as well. And, include, and it also includes other um, districts as well. So the last table is about management-related risk factors. So it was found that majority of the farmers were experiencing abortions in their herds, and a small number of them were uh, isolating sick animals, and they were also not screening new animals. Uh, they, they were not uh, isolating sick animals and screening new animals. So in conclusion, the study has, um, can state that uh, the occurrence of bovine brucellosis throughout the study period was not correlated or did not have a relationship with the variability of temperature and rainfall. And based on the findings of the study, we can suggest that bovine brucellosis is highly influenced by the management-related risk factors as opposed to others. And I'd like to acknowledge my supervisor, Dr. Chitura, and my co supervisor, Prof. Um, Diaz. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, Ma'am Luisa. Shall we have questions and comments for Ma'am Sianero? Uh, uh, thanks so, so much, uh, Ma'am Sianero, for such a very insightful uh, presentation. I think uh, this is a very you know, a good study going forward. I'm looking at the management, you know, because there are a lot of diseases today, like the, the foot and mouth diseases and the so on. So with this uh, uh, management, uh, what can you recommend? Is there any way that you can, you know, you know, uh, you know, tell the farmers how to manage this, you know, these diseases, uh, how to minimize the risk uh, with regard to management? Yeah, thanks very much. So from what I found out is that most farmers, they do have knowledge of the disease, but however, the practices are not being prioritized. So in order for them to understand, they, uh, I feel like I would suggest um, government intervention whereby they create campaigns and community engagements where farmers are being educated about um, the diseases that some of them not only threaten their animals, but it threatens their health as well. So I would, um, I think, government interventions would be there. And also encourage farmers, which I've interviewed, to create groups amongst themselves if the government is not doing anything, where they will educate each other. I know you are not a medical student, but uh, since you mentioned that this disease is a zoonosis, what kind of symptoms would you expect to see in humans who pick up this disease? Okay. So as I mentioned that humans contract the disease um, by ingesting uh, infected or contaminated, I'm sorry, contaminated milk products. So most of the symptoms involve fever, sweating, back pains, and in severe cases, you can find that your central nervous system is being compromised as well. So those are the symptoms. No, it doesn't, unfortunately. And it cannot pass from one person to another, but it's from the animal to the human. It looks like we do not have any more questions and comments from MC Anero. Shall we give a round of applause? Okay. Um, this is what is going to happen. I'm going to 
give a body break for five minutes to allow our adjudicators <laughs> to yeah rest a little bit for five minutes. Whilst they are doing that, um, Lerohu Sebati and Mugitla Naskobela, please get ready. Those will be our last two presentations after that five minutes body break. You would understand that we need to continue the session with the adjudicators. That's the reason that we need this break because we can all go out sometimes, but they cannot go out when the presentation are on. Thank you so much in advance for your understanding. Five minutes, we will resume after five minutes.
I was quantify nutrition, nutrition and growth of moringa growing in nutrient deficient soils and different soil textural classes. And our objective was to determine the effect of soil nutrient deficiency and soil texture on growth and plant nutrient concentration of moringa. The study was done in the shade house at the University of Limpopo, and these are the coordinates where the University of Limpopo lies. The average temperature for the study were recorded on a, daily, on a monthly basis, and February recorded 30 degrees Celsius, and June recorded 19 degrees Celsius. And our study was comprised of four treatments, which was clay, lumisand, sandy clay loom, and sandy loom. And this, these percentages inside the brackets represent the clay, clay content, clay, percent, clay particles of the soils. And our study was, run, was arranged in a randomized complete block design. The samples were drawn from our soil treatments and for analysis. And therefore, for physical properties, we used the particle size distribution and the nutri nut chemical properties were determined for soil pH, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. And prior to planting, pots were filled with soils according to the treatments, and they were planted using seeds, which were soaked 24 hours before planting. And the thinning was done 14 days before after emergence. And then watering was done to a field capacity on the day of planting. And going forward, they were irrigated on the second day from previous irrigation. This this is a, our road to achieving our objective, where moving up to 90 days after emergence, were uprooted and, and were separated into different organs. And then they were oven dried, whereby they were later on weighed using the weighing scale. And then they were transferred into a pound of tubes after being ground. And then the, these tubes were subjected to ICP MS for analysis of nutrients, which was nitrogen, phosphorus, and carbon. Ladies and gentlemen, our results were, were subjected to analysis of variants using statistics 10, where significant values were from the treatments were found, and the Turkey's HSD was used to separate the means of at the probability of 0 0.05. On our findings, we found that sandy clay loom, I mean sandy loom at the soil pH which was higher than the rest of the soil treatments. And this soil pH can be linked with higher phosphorus and potassium in, in sandy loom soils. And the, the similar studies, the similar observations were observed by Austin China et al. 2015. And then again, we have soil nitrogen, where it was high in clay soils. This one was also similar to a study by Bupa Bema Baba et al. 2021, where they found nitrogen being high in clay soils. Ladies and gentlemen, for every plant to grow and develop well, nutrients has to be available in the soils in a form that is acce accessible to the plants. And given our graphs here, we can see that leaves, sandy loom, sandy loom grown sapling seedlings which were, which had high leaf biomass and shoot biomass as well as total plant dry weight. And this results contradicted with with Baja et al. 2013, where they found their total plant biomass being high in clay soils. And the despite, the, despite our biomass being high in sandy loom, the root biomass was high in sandy clay loom. And this could be attributed to the fact that some minor nutrients which were available in sandy loom were higher 
compared to those which were found in Sendilum. This, uh, this includes zinc and, and calcium, which calcium is acting as a source for promoting growth in the secondary growth in the roots, whereby root, root thickness is increased. This, uh, our, this graph here shows our nutrient composition of our plants, in our plants. And it was found that, st by study by Bupapema Bapetal, found that there were insignificant nutrient composition in the Moringa plants. Hence, in our case, we found that the, in our case, we found that nitrogen was high in clay. And this makes sense because clay soils had high nitrogen in their soil. This can be also suggested that the higher amount of nitrogen in the soil also leads to higher accumulation of that particular nitrogen source in the nutrients. And similar trend was also observed in sandy, sandy loom where plant phosphorus was high. And this can also be as a result where nitrogen, I mean, where, where phosphorus was high in sandy loom soils as compared to other studies. And unfortunately, there was no significant difference when it comes to phosphor when it comes to calcium when it comes to plant carbon. Ladies and gentlemen, it was evident that different soil treatments influenced growth and nutrient composition of moringa, and the higher amount of nitrogen, nitrogen and phosphorus in the soil also re resulted in plants having that particular nutrients in the plant. And again, we've seen that sandy loom soils comprised the higher biomass uh, as compared to other treatments. And also, we can recommend that sandy looms are best for growth of moringa in such a way that we can retrieve nitrogen from the soil as a way of supplementing it into other feeds which lack nitrogen. And again, we can use sandy loom soils whereby we achieved phosphorus enriched yields. And this one can be used by farmers, especially when they want to grow their foliage. And at the end of the day, they will be having a foliage which is high in phosphorus. I would like to acknowledge University of Limpopo, NRF, and my dear supervisors. I thank you. Thank you very much, Lerohu. Shall we have questions and comments for Sebati? Just a quick one, Chairperson. Okay. Um, based on your results, what advice can you give um, people, people about this moringa? Based on my results, what advice can I give? What message are you giving us about this moringa based on your results? Okay, based on my results is that moringa is capable of growing in in, in sufficient, is capable of growing in soils which are insufficient in nutrients, but a certain level of nutrients has to be reached so that it can grow well. The last one, why Moringa? Why your interest is on Moringa? Why? Why you decided to do your research on Moringa? Oh, it's because there is a limited information regarding plant nutrient composition and growth on Moringa in South Africa. So in Limpopo, is only f the, uh, the, no in the information that is available is only low. So we are trying to increase more knowledge regarding Moringa so that it can be adopted by other, other neighboring regions. Okay. Looks like there are no more. Okay, there's another question, that's it. Thank you so much for the beautiful presentation. 
My question is based on your conclusion. You mentioned that it can be used as storage. So for someone who doesn't know what storage is, can you please explain what storage is? Okay, thank you for the question. Uh, storage can be explained as a, when you grow a plant and then you, you allow it to be grazed by animals or you can even harvest it and then supply your animals where they are located. So in this case, you can use moringa and while it's still rel relatively young, you can harvest it for your crop, for your livestock to graze or maybe let your livestock into the plantation so that it can graze because when they are, when the moringa is still young, new more nutrients are still in abundance. Okay, thank you very much, Lerohu. Shall we give uh, Lerohu a round of applause? <laughs> Our next and last presenter is Mugitlana Sokobela. Mugitlana is going to talk about an assessment of domestic gray water reuse, a case study of Ratoka village in Pulukwani local municipality of South Africa. Over to you, um, Mem Sokhobela. Thank you. Good day, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Mukitana Rinki Sokhobela. I'll be presenting to you an assessment of domestic gray water reuse, a case study of Ratoka village in Polokwane local municipality, South Africa, supervised by Professor Molel and Dr. Lezwalo. Firstly, I would like to explain a bit about water. As we all know that water is an essential resource to all lives. And as such, it carries, nutri it carries nutri nutrients to the human cells and also to the brain. A lot of communities in South Africa are still battling to get access to potable water to meet their daily needs. And as such, it is required for everyone about water. Water is not only the clean water, but also gray water can be used to supplement the, water, the fresh water resources. By using the coping mechanisms of water, the pressure on the, on the fresh water resources can be eased. The increasing human activities such as growth in population and economy and economic growth, they actually decrease the capacity of the natural environment to provide with fresh water. The aim of the study is to assess the potential of gray water, of gray water reuse at Ratoka village. And the objectives of the study are as follows. To identify sources of fresh, water reuse, of fresh water and the nature of potable water supply. To analyze the quality of gray water. To establish the potential of gray water reuse by the Ratoka village households. And also to determine the awareness and perceptions of Ratoka, uh, Ratoka households on the reuse of gray water. The research questions are displayed there. Katoka village is one of the 23 villages in Ramatapa community. The reason why Ratoka was chosen out of the 23 villages is because it has higher population compared to the other 22, 22 villages. And it also has a lot of economic development. To to complete this study, a mixed research method was used, which is the qualitative and quantitative methods. The sample, the sample size of the study was 3,086 3, households, which, is ages, which was 10% of the whole sample frame. 93 water samples were collected from selected households from the 307 households which were used. And, to, and the syst systematic random sampling was used to collect the data. For the, for the gray water characteristics, a hedge to be to meter was used, also model 21,000N and hedge session machines were used. And also to 
to determine the concentration of the metals in the samples, the inductively coupled plasma was used. This is how the objectives were analyzed. The first objective was analyzed narratively and using person chi squared test. Objective two was analyzed using laboratory and descriptive analysis. Objective three was, was analyzed using descriptive statistics and person chi squared test. And the last ob objective was analyzed using thematic narrative analysis and person chi squared test. The results of the study found that there, were, there was presence of physical, aesthetic, and inorganic characteristics in the gray water samples collected. And it was found that the alkalinity and the alkalinity of salts and detergents used in the used when producing gray water affected sorry about that. The salts and detergents used when creating gray water, they affected the alkalinity of the samples. It was found that there was a higher organic and physical pollutants from the gray water, from the kitchen and the laundry more than the bathroom gray water. Displayed here are the laboratory results of the 93 samples collected. During the analysis, it was, it was actually discovered that the demographic of Atoka village, the awareness and perceptions, the water scarcity, availability, accessibility, and also, and also the depletion or overuse of freshwater resources had an effect on the intentions and willingness of the household to reuse their gray water. It was also found that there's no enough published information on gray water reuse that Ratoka village household has access to. The, the willingness to reuse, the willingness of the household to reuse their gray water was found to be 77% based on the analyzed questionnaires. It was found that only 22% of the respondents were willing to consume, were willing to consume fruit, food crops that are irrigated from their gray water. It was concluded by the study that there is potential of gray water reuse at Ratoka village. It was also concluded that inorganic characteristics, concentrations, and metals were found in all the gray water samples in different concentrations. It was observed that the soil change in texture and color where the gray water, re where the gray water was used to irrigate. The other conclusion was that the demographic awareness and water resources, they influenced the household's intention and willingness to reuse their gray water. It is recommended to the Ratoka village household to reuse more of their gray water in order to save the fresh water available for them. It is also recommended to them that they use gray water to irrigate food crops that need to be cooked before eating so that they can reduce the potential of, the potential of, okay, so that they can be able to be safe from the pathogens that can be in the gray water. And it was also recommended by the study that the Atoka village household should practice the water filtering methods, practice the cleaning mechanisms of gray water such as sand filtering before reusing their gray water. It is also recommended to future studies that they evaluate the effect of culture and religion on the reuse of gray water. I would like to acknowledge the people displayed on the slide. Here are the references used. Thank you. Thank you, um, Kitlana, for the presentation. Shall we have um, comments and questions from Kitlana? Thank you very much. Um, in just in case you engage with the community again, I think to increase the preference of using gray water for, for gardening, you can also include the fact that in, some, in a lot of instances, soapy water, particularly that from kitchen, has been used as a natural 
pesticides, um, especially because when it comes to household gardens, they don't use our synthetic chemicals. So that can maybe contribute towards encouraging them to use that soapy water for their gardens in that it will help them control pests in their production. Noted, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I want to ask of the sources, where does this grey water originate? The grey water originates from sources such as ki the kitchen, the bathroom, and also the laundry. All right, thank you. Um, thank you for your wonderful presentation. Um, I would like to know um, how effective is the method that you have um, suggested a concentration in, in treatment of, of, of um, the grey water. You mean the sand filtering? Yeah, so the sand filtering. It's actually effective because some studies has reported on it. That's why I was recommending that the households can use the method to clean. It's actually cheaper more than the other grey water cleaning technologies. For recommendation, I would also recommend you to imply or implement techniques that include bioremediation techniques, which are cost effective. In bioremediation techniques, uh, microorganisms are utilized to degrade or remove pollutants accumulated in water. So that's another method that is effective. Thank you very much. Shall we give um, Gitana a round of applause? <laughs> this was our last presentation for the day. As I indicated before, five minutes body break that the last two presenters are not present. Let me take this opportunity before I hand back the reins to say thank you very much to our adjudicators, our audiences, and also our postgraduate and staff members who have enriched our knowledge with the research that they are conducting. I also would like to say thank you to my coaches, Dr. Radebe and Professor Pofu. Thank you and uh, to all the postgraduate that have presented, keep up the good work, continue to advance science, as well as the colleagues who have shared with us the research. We had a beautiful, um, the past three days, sharing knowledge and making history. Let us continue to make history before the eyes of those that are watching. I'm going to hand over back to Professor Masuku to give further announcement and direction with regard to the next activity. Thank you so much. Uh, afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, few announcements. Our gala will start at um, half past five but we are expected to be seated at five o'clock so that when the university uh, management arrive, we start on time. But importantly, know that we are only responsible for you when you are within these premises. The moment you leave these premises, we are no longer responsible. Yesterday, I had to take a few of your friends to campus, and uh, I don't think I will do it again today. Make sure that if you go to Mall of the North or wherever, you make special arrangements, but then you are not our responsibility, right? Ours is to take you from campus to here, from here back to campus, and within these premises. Importantly, we have arranged few rooms 
for ladies to freshen up. Remember I said yesterday, you must come with your um, special attire, the kwai kwai, ponds. Uh, you, you will be informed around two where the rooms are. Preferably you start now. So that because the rooms are not many, it's only four, then one will give to guys, one to staff members, and two to ladies. So you know, guys, I know they, they are not going to change. You'll see them. They are, they, they are now <laughs> ready for the girl already. Uh, and, 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 and after that, just move closer to where the... the the gala will be, is that other building where we are eating our, our lunch. Just be around that area so that when we ask you to get in, then you are not that far. So please don't go to the mall. Please, I'm pleading with you. Um, oh, okay, something else. <laughs> and thanks, guys, you, you, were, you were very obedient. I accept that exceptional Small and naughty boys, but other than that, you, you, you were very good, good students. And colleagues, thank you for being patient and being here and asking questions. We are everybody in here is already being thanked, but we will still continue doing that at at, at our gala. Prof Sinolo is saving something. The last message. I know you are. It's almost one. Some of us we didn't eat breakfast. And thanks to this collective here for uh, steering the ship. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. I won't take much of the time, but uh, it would not be appropriate for me to go back without saying thank you to our team, technical team that supported us throughout the last three days. Thank you so much. We really appreciate it. We know the challenges that we faced with load shedding and all the stuff, but they ran around with us to ensure that we continue to present uh, our research and continue to discuss. We really appreciate and thank you very much. As Prof said, all this vote of thanks will still be alluded to in appropriate times. But I just felt I should say thank you to them because we really work closely, hand in hand with them. Thank you so much and have a good afternoon. We are going to eat. <laughs>